Hi, I'm Professor Diane Orenlicker. I've been on the WCL faculty since 1992. Before that, I was a full-time human rights lawyer and I have continued practicing in the human rights space ever since I joined the faculty. Um, so I'm gonna address the question, what advice would I give to a young human rights lawyer? And it's hard to distill that response down to just a couple of pointers, but here's what I would say is important. First of all, passion is hugely important, but it's not enough to make you an effective human rights lawyer. So don't, don't put your passion away. You're gonna need it to fuel you through um, a lot of hard times in the field of human rights. But you need to not only pay attention to all of the really rigorous details of preparation for a case, if you're doing typical casework, but you also need to pay attention to the context of the issues that you're working on. You need to understand things like who are the victims of the human rights violations you're addressing? What did they want? What's a successful outcome for them rather than what you might want to see in terms of making new case law? And also in terms of context, and this is hugely important, what's going to be effective? And that's the hardest question to answer. And in fact, a lot of my academic work in recent years has been about looking back over the experience we've had in human rights over the past, well, maybe 30 years or so, and testing out our strategies, what worked, what didn't, under what circumstances did certain strategies, like say, economic sanctions, criminal prosecutions, under what circumstances were they successful? A related question is, in addition to a particular measure like bringing litigation um, that we might think of as a successful response to human rights threats. What other things have to go on um, in addition to those measures? And let me be more specific to give you an example. I, uh, I wrote a book about the impact of a Yugo the Yugoslavia War Crimes Tribunal, which was set up by the UN Security Council in the midst of a really brutal armed conflict in the former Yugoslavia. Um, and my book looked at the question, what was the impact of this tribunal on the ground in the lives of people who lived through this brutal um, conflict? And one of the things that I learned in the course of researching this book is that the answer to that question turned in part on what else the international community was doing. So a really straightforward example is that the tribunal was more successful in actually prosecuting people when the international community united to ensure that suspects who were indicted by the tribunal were arrested. And that might seem really obvious, but it in fact involved marshalling a whole range of um, concerted action on the part of the international community. When the international community started to retreat from the region and stopped marshalling efforts around the work of the tribunal, the tribunal's own impact became much more attenuated. And so what I'm sort of trying to illustrate with this example is that it's not enough to say, well, gosh, these people did terrible things, they should be punished. But you need to ask, in what circumstances would prosecutions be successful? What do we mean by success? What would prosecutions mean to the victims? Um, and what else needs to happen besides prosecutions in order to move a country that has been through the worst um, kinds of abuses imaginable toward one that over time reliably protects the rights of its citizens? So that's a lot of hard work, but it's the most gratifying work I can think of. Thank you.